Good day to everyone. In this video, we are going to be going a little bit more into ionic bonds. We're going to look at what's called a lattice energy, so the energy that's holding that lattice together, or the energy to break that lattice apart. So, when we have an ionic bond, an ionic bond is formed when one atom takes an electron from another atom, and then those two become ions and those ions then share that electrostatic interaction uh, the positive and negative charges so um, generally when we're talking about ionic bonds the atoms within the bond will make an electron or a uh, yeah, electron configuration that is isoelectronic to the noble gases So they will make the ions by becoming isoelectronic to a noble gas. This is not how this works for a transition metal or a lanthanide or an actinide, but when we're talking about our main group, so our group one or our group two, our alkali metals, our alkaline earth metals, we're talking about them losing electrons in order to become isoelectronic with a noble gas. So isoelectronic, same number of electrons. So they are becoming, oops, they are becoming isoelectronic with our noble gases. So they're going to be losing electrons. They're going to be losing electrons until they reach that noble gas configuration. So our metals lose electrons to achieve a noble gas configuration. Our nonmetals are going to gain electrons in order to get to that noble gas configuration. And you can always figure out how many electrons you need to lose or gain in order to become a noble gas configuration by looking at the periodic table. So we have 1, 2, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, and 18 as our group numbers. So group one, our alkali metals, they're going to lose one electron. Group two, lose two electrons. So these will lose electrons so they can go back to that noble gas configuration, the one before it. Group 13 has three valence electrons, so it's going to lose three electrons. So that is our other ones that will lose electrons. Namely, we're looking at aluminum and gallium. And then, if we're talking about group 14, we are generally only talking about things that covalently bond, because in order to get to a noble, noble gas configuration, you would either need to lose three electrons, or sorry, lose four electrons, or gain four electrons, which is just too much, too much energy. So, covalent for these. 
As we get further down the periodic table, it does weirder things. So we're going to ignore those as well. And then going over to group 15. Group 15 has a total of five valence electrons. So it is easier to gain three to get to that octet than lose five to get to an octet. So it's going to gain three electrons. If we get on to group 16, six valence electrons, easier to just gain two electrons. And then lastly, our group 17, seven valence electrons to get to an octet it just needs one so it's going to gain one electron 18 again doo, 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 doo. it's already at a noble gas configuration so it does nothing okay so now we know how we form our ions let's look at the formation of an ionic compound so when a metal when a metal and a nonmetal come in contact with sufficient energy we call that our activation energy a redox reaction will recur so we've already gone over what a redox reaction is a redox reaction we've got uh, oxidation loss of electrons and reduction gain of electrons so we can have something like sodium solid coming into contact with chlorine gas to produce sodium chloride solid. This is very exothermic producing this. Um, and in this process, sodium goes from sodium zero to sodium plus. And then our chlorine goes from a neutral chlorine to Cl minus. Okay, now that energy to take the ions and form a solid, so our sodium ion plus our chlorine ion. The energy associated with this process is called the lattice energy. Specifically, we describe or we define the lattice energy as the energy um, to separate one mole of a solid ionic compound into its gaseous ions. So technically, lattice energy is the opposite way, our sodium chloride solid going to sodium ions and chlorine ions. And this is very high energy. This energy that is required to do this for sodium chloride is 788 kilojoules per mole. That is pretty significant. 
Um, and of course, if we have the reverse process right here, the opposite of our lattice energy, just delta H of our reaction, although we can still call it lattice, just for simplification purposes, is going to be negative 788 kilojoules per mole. So as they come in contact with each other, those two gaseous ions, they come together and release a significant amount of energy. Okay, so we can consider our lattice energy the stabil st uh, stabilization by arranging oscillatory charged ions into a ionic solid or lattice. So the lattice energy can be thought of as the stabilization that results in arranging charged ions. I realize that that is redundant, but that's okay. Into an ionic lattice or ionic solid or lattice. And remember, we're going to surround cations with anions and then anions with cations, but we will never put an anion together with an anion or a cation together with a cation. And hopefully you also remember that ionic solids or ionic lattices are a 3D shape with cations and anions beyond count. So we always show an ionic, solid, solid, eh, an ionic solid as its empirical formula. Because we do not have a discrete formula unit like we see with a covalent substance. So with a covalent substance like water, H2O, that is a discrete molecule. So it is by itself and it's interacting with other water molecules through interactions that are not bonds. With a ionic substance, we are interacting all around with bonds. So everywhere you look, there are ionic bonds. All the ions are held together by ionic bonds and there are just ions beyond count. So the larger the lattice energy, the more stable those ions are together. So if we look at lattice energies, we can look at stuff like lithium fluoride, which has a lattice energy of 1030 kilojoules per mole, versus something like lithium iodide, which goes down to 730 kilojoules per mole. Okay. Or we can compare it to something like, oh, let's see. potassium fluoride at 808 kilojoules per mole or potassium iodide. Oh, that was not a very good example because I don't have that one. Let me actually try another one. Let's do sodium fluoride and sodium iodide. I have those tabulated values. So our sodium fluoride 910 kilojoules per mole, sodium iodide 682 kilojoules per mole. So we can compare our cations, right? Or we can compare our anions. And what we see as our cations become larger, our lattice energy goes down. Same thing is true if we look at fluorine versus iodine. As our anion becomes larger, 
our lattice energy goes down. And this relates back to our electrostatic potential energy. Remember, our electrostatic potential energy is a constant times by our magnitude of charge on our first substance, magnitude of charge of our second substance, divided by distance. So the greater the distance, and that's what we're changing here, we're not changing magnitude of charge, we're changing distance. The greater the distance, the smaller the electrostatic charge. So as we increase the radii of our cation or our anion, we're going to decrease our um, lattice energy because these things aren't being held together as much. We also definitely see this as we go from something like um, lithium chloride to something like magnesium chloride. Here we're not changing the size so much as we are changing the magnitude of charge. We're going from lithium plus to magnesium two plus. So here, increased charge. So charge is on the top, increasing the charge should increase the lattice energy, and that is what we see with magnesium chloride. It has a lattice energy of 2,326 kilojoules per mole. Very large because now we have something that um, has much uh, greater charge, so greater value up here. And we see it even more significantly if we do go to something like magnesium oxide, where we have we're now going from a Cl minus to a O2 minus. We're decreasing size and increasing charge in this case. And we go to a lattice energy of 3,795 kilojoules per mole. So the greater the charge, the smaller the ions, the greater the lattice energy. OK, now we are going to do lattice energy problems. Um, and we're going to do so. Uh, by looking at our different energies related to ionic bond formation. So solving for lattice energies or solving for um, enthalpies within these reactions um, can be done with what's called a Born-Haber cycle. So we're going to look at our Born-Haber cycle next. And after we look at our energies associated with ionic bond formation. So, so far, we have looked at two already. One is our heat of formation. So, taking our elemental forms of our atoms, putting them into their compound. So, this is our enthalpy of formation. All right, so something we are already familiar with. Um, so this is our overall energy change associated with the formation of the ionic compound, right? overall change. But there are other energies we can look at beyond just our formation energy. That's our overall. The other one we've already looked at is our lattice energy. Breaking that ionic solid down into its gaseous ions, which looks different, hopefully, than our formation. Formation, when we're forming, um, and it's from elemental forms. With our lattice, we are breaking, and it's in the ion gaseous form. So forms you don't usually see. Now, there are other energies that are going to be associated with, because we're going to be going from one to the other. So we have to have things that are in the same forms. We see that we have our... We see that we have sodium chloride solids that are the same, but 
our sodium sources are different, our chlorine sources are different in these two. So we're going to look at things like the enthalpy of dissociation. Okay, so how much energy is required to break apart a diatomic molecule? Okay, so this is taking our chlorine gas. and breaking it down into chlorine like so. Okay, so we can call this, if we we're talking about um, taking that formation of chlorine gas, we can be, this is the formation of that chlorine. Our next one is ionization energy. Ionization energy is the energy to form the cation. Okay. Our ionization energy is taking the gaseous metal and producing the gaseous metal ion. So, that right there is our ionization energy. Then we have electron affinity. This is the energy associated with the formation of the anion. Okay, so again, we have a gaseous substance, and here we add in an electron, producing our gaseous anion. Okay, we could have an additional electron affinity, we can have a second ionization energy, all sorts of things, right? Okay, so. Let's actually look at how we would solve or what we call a Born-Haber cycle. So here is our Born-Haber cycle and it's a visualization of that, um, those, all those energies. So we call it a visual means of analyzing reaction energies. So, with these, we are concerned with the formation of ionic compound. And we generally use these Born-Haber cycles to determine the lattice energy or one of the other energies that I just mentioned. So use to calculate one of the energies. So one of these energies, dissociation, ionization, electron affinity, lattice energy, or enthalpy of formation. So we can do a Born-Haber cycle for sodium chloride. We start out 
with our formation, our sodium solid plus one half chlorine gas goes to sodium chloride solid. This energy itself is placed in as our um, formation energy. So let's go ahead, write that in. We've got our sodium solid plus one half chlorine gas. Those are going to combine and when they do, they produce our sodium chloride solid. This is always how you write the first part of this. And this change in energy here is that delta H of formation. If we had an endothermic reaction, it would be written the other way. Um, but in the case of sodium solid and chlorine gas coming together, that is an exothermic process. So we would say that the solid or the elemental forms are higher in energy. So we do an arrow down to that chlorine. Okay. So now we've got our formation. What we're trying to eventually get to is our lattice energy. And I like to write that on the other side, right here. Our lattice energy is our sodium ion in the gaseous form, plus our chlorine ion in the gaseous form, coming together to produce our sodium chloride salt. Again, this is exothermic, right? This is our lattice energy. So definitely exothermic. After you've written in your enthalpy of formation and your lattice energy, you can start writing out your Born-Haber cycle. So we need to get our sodium solid to sodium plus in the gaseous form. We need to get our chlorine solid, or sorry, chlorine gas into a dissociated form. And then after we get into a dissociated form, um, we can add in our anion or form our anion by adding an electron. So the first thing I want to do is I want to form that sodium gas. So we're going to go with this, the delta H of formation of the sodium gas. So form our gas. So this is what we're doing right here. We're going from sodium solid to sodium gas. We can also call this the enthalpy of sublimation because we're going from a solid to a gas. And this will produce our sodium gas plus that right there. Okay. Now, please note that um, we have gone up because it requires energy to go from a solid to a gas. We're then going to break apart. We're going to dissociate our chlorine. And we can also, besides just calling this dissociation energy, we can also just call this the enthalpy of formation of chlorine. Okay. So we're forming our chlorine in the gaseous form. So this gives us Na gas plus Cl gas. So now we've got both of our substances as ions. We're now going to, or sorry, both of our substances as gases. Now we're going to form ions. First thing we want to do is ionization energy.
Sorry, trying to keep everything in here. Next is our ionization energy. And it's our first ionization energy, and it's of sodium. So, remember that our ionization energy is of the gaseous form. Like so. So, we're going to go from our gaseous sodium metal to our ion form. And then the last thing is our electron affinity, which is exothermic, mostly. So that's electron affinity of that chlorine gas. Okay. So that is a Born-Haber cycle. Start out with your formation and your lattice energy in there. Pay attention to the sign of your formation, though. If you had a um, endothermic enthalpy of formation, you would look like this instead of looking like what we saw. Okay, so let's try this on an actual example. So we've got calcium chloride. That is what we're trying to form. And we want to draw the Born-Haber cycle and calculate the less energy. Okay, so when you see something like this, you will also be given some data tabulated. Either I will give you a data table or I will tell you the information like I'm about to right now. Here, our enthalpy of formation of calcium chloride. Is equal to negative 795 kilojoules per mole. Our enthalpy of sublimation of calcium. is equal to positive 178 kilojoules per mole. And then we have our first ionization energy, our I1 for calcium is positive 590 kilojoules per mole. Our second ionization energy, I2 for calcium is equal to 11.45 kilojoules per mole. Our enthalpy of formation of chlorine, gaseous chlorine from Cl2 is positive 121 kilojoules per mole. And then our electron affinity for chlorine in the gaseous form is going to be equal to negative 349 kilojoules per mole. So we're going to start out with this and we're going to add in our lattice energy. So we have calcium solid plus chlorine gas is going to combine to form calcium chloride solid. And then the other piece of information we have 
is if we have gaseous 2 plus chlorine plus gaseous Cl minus, they will combine to form uh, calcium chloride, which is our lattice energy, which is what we are trying to solve for. Now, we need to go from calcium solid to calcium gas, and then from calcium gas to calcium 2 plus. We need to go from chlorine gas to chlorine 2 gas to individual chlorine molecules or atoms. And then we need to give each of those chlorines a negative charge. So first things first, let's add in our sublimation energy. So it's our delta H of sublimation, which gives us calcium gas plus dinothin chlorine. So we'll just call it that. Again, this could be called the delta H of formation of our gaseous calcium. You'll see it either way. Okay, next we're going to take and dissociate our chlorines. So this is our formation of our chlorine. But note, I am forming it twice, and this is only for one, so we need to multiply this by two. Next, we're going to take our calcium, go from our gaseous state into our um, positive charge, positive one, and then positive two. So we have our I1 for calcium. And then I2. Giving us Ca plus two plus two Cl gas, and then we're going to go from our neutral chlorine to our anion. Again, this is our electron affinity is for one of these. We have two, so we're going to multiply our electron affinity of chlorine times by two. Okay, that is our Born-Haber cycle. Note that this side is equal to this side, right? Their energies are going to be equal. The changes in those energies. So the way that we would do this is we would say that our delta H, not a formation of our calcium chloride, is going to be equal to all the rest of them. So it's going to be equal to our delta H of sublimation of calcium and two times by delta H a formation of chlorine plus our I1 of calcium plus our I2 of calcium plus two times by our electron affinity for chlorine plus our lattice energy of calcium chloride. And then all we do is plug and chug. So our enthalpy of formation of calcium chloride is negative 795. I'm going to keep units out of this. They're all kilojoules per mole. So at the end, I'll put kilojoules per mole on. Our sublimation energy for calcium is equal to 178 kilojoules per mole plus our enthalpy of formation of each individual chlorine is 121 so we'll take that two times by 121 
and then add in our ionization energy, first ionization energy, 590. Let me put everything in brackets. And then our second ionization energy, 1145. Then our two electron affinities. So two times by our electron affinity, negative 349. And then this is going to be all added to our lattice energy. We're going to take all of this and do math and solve for our lattice energy. So we're going to take negative 795 minus 178 minus 2 times by 121 minus 590 minus 1145 minus 2 times by negative 349. And what we get is a lattice energy equal to negative 2,252 kilojoules per mole. And if we look at calcium chloride, calcium chloride um, should have, or something like that should have around a 2,000, so that makes sense. Okay, now this is negative because we are going this direction with our lattice energy, right? So we're going from our gaseous forms to our solid, our gaseous ions to our solid. So that releases energy, which results in a negative value. But remember that lattice energy itself in a table would be given as a positive value. Okay, that is everything for this video. Bye, y'all.